it's a topic that has been a primary focus for me um, throughout my career, a topic of the utmost importance. Um, I'm really excited to be here for many reasons, one of which is I'm actually all about new agrarians as an educator. And um, as Dean was a proud supporter of the Wisconsin School for Beginning Dairy and Livestock Farmers. Um, but more than that, um, you'll see from a little snippet of my story that I have been in some ways operating in a really parallel trajectory. And this talk represents all different kinds of convergences as does the community in the room, and as will this conference, as we turn to face enormous challenges, but also, of course, enormous opportunities for new ways of thinking and working. I'd like to start where, um, where I think it's I, at the foundation, which is in a world where we expect nine billion of us by mid-century, as a matter of fact, current estimates suggest we already produce enough food per capita on a global average for every one of us on the planet today. And in fact, some experts believe today we could feed 9 billion people. That is a really important thing to realize because it highlights a critical theme of my talk, which is it isn't just about pushing agricultural systems to the max, especially to short-term yield maxima, it's about creating a healthy food system in balance for all. And so um, this slide is a slide I got from an International Agricultural Research Center that I've worked with. It's called the AVRDC, or the World Vegetable Center. Now, I realize many of you in the room don't work on vegetables. I've been charged to tell you about seeds, from seeds to resilient systems. And one other thesis of this talk is that actually it's a whole lot of different kinds of seeds improve for a whole lot of different kinds of traits. So I'm not gonna especially talk about grasslands or trees or crops, commodity crops or specialty crops. I'm gonna talk about systems and I'm gonna start with the reason we manage agricultural systems, which is to take care of ourselves. This slide shows our current stats as to how well we're doing taking care of ourselves. The top line says we have nearly a billion people undernourished, malnourished or hungry. We have two to three and a half billion suffering from micronutrient deficiencies of various significant types. And we have over a billion of us suffering from health consequences of overnutrition. Unless you think that is a developed country problem, um, it is. It's an epidemic in our country and likely the reason that the generation behind us, those new agrarians and their colleagues, face life expectancies shorter than ours for the first time in US history. But it's also an enormous problem in the developing world. All signs that on a world of per capita food sufficiency, we're not doing that well with respect to taking care of ourselves. I like to highlight this slide because it's really important to me, and it's a very important part of what the U.S. Department of Agriculture does. When I made this slide in 2010 and 11, that number was one in seven. Today, it's one in six. And in fact, um, it's clear that this food assistance is a critical part of how um, our country is working now. And the choices we make in delivering that food assistance is a really important part of the pressure on agriculture and the public health picture. We're bringing those dynamics into focus. They're extremely important. And the slide says clearly, we have shown in this country because we've had 150 years of experience focused on maximizing food production as the way to achieve food security. We know obviously now we've proven to ourselves beyond a shadow of doubt, there's more to it than that. We must use a systems perspective to approach the challenge of feeding 9 billion people. And of course, you all know as grasslands managers, range managers, we must use a systems approach to caring for our planet. In fact, a really critical, a really central observation about agriculture in this century is obvious and profound. We have, however many of us we have, on one planet, one closed system. Now that seems obvious, but I can tell you as a representative of a number of different kinds of research organizations, that is not the way we were built 100 to 150 years ago, and that is not the way we have acted. We've acted like we can handle this patch of ground to get 
as much of whatever it is we need right this minute from that patch of ground, and we are excused from what happens off that patch of ground, we're excused from what happens later. Now those of you in grasslands are better than that relative to croplands, and those who manage forested resources have also had to contend with time and space. But in general, we have not managed agriculture for its second really important purpose. And this coalition is an exception to that. Agriculture is a critical way we provision ourselves now. Obviously, it's probably a good idea to think about later, but it is also a critical way we take care of our planet. I won't belabor the statistics, but there are um, a number of, of ways to think about agriculture literally as our dominant form of terrestrial planetary care. Now, we have not innovated with both those things in mind. And that is the promise of the research community and the opportunity for innovation in the 21st century. So really the question before us and, and a specific job I was tasked to help with in a global fora is, what's our plan? So I'm going to tell you a little story because it, it connects many things to many things and it connects me to our next speaker. Um, I want to tell you a little story about how it is that a plant breeder who was taught yield, 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 Molly, that's all you need to know in graduate school, has come to be preaching to the choir probably here and taking this message to many influential organizations. Because in fact, far from pulling me to the edge of agricultural research, I would argue Gus Speth is correct. The consequences of the way we have framed our activities on this planet are now so accessible that many serious players are recognizing what you recognize, and that is we've got to make some changes. So I'm going to tell you a little story that I call a parable of success and a parable of failure with implications both for food and nutritional security and a turning point for me personally as a plant breeder. This photograph is a field, a tomato field, because I happen to work on vegetables. I picked vegetables because I could understand they were important in nutrition and they were important for livelihoods, food systems reasons. There's no tomatoes in that field. In West Africa, like many places on Earth, we're seeing a changing climate. What that means is diseases move and change. So in the early 2000s in West Africa, this photograph was taken in, in Mali, this plague of white fly transmitted viruses came in and blasted out vegetable production. I was called in as somebody who's worked in this space for a long time, and the next, um, the next photograph shows with whom and how, and in the middle, let's see if I can find the pointer here, oops. See if in the middle, right in the middle of that gazebo is your next speaker. That's Michael Mazurik. Michael was first a technician, then a graduate student, and now I'm really pleased to say um, a young agrarian, my successor in my job at Cornell University where this story takes place. And that is one of the most important things we can all think about is who's coming after us and how many of them are there. So you're gonna see, um, in a few minutes why I am so proud and happy about what has happened since this picture was taken. So this group got together. We worked on genetics of disease resistance. When I went into science, I was really interested in using genetic disease resistance to reduce pesticide loads in environments. Again, thinking systematically. When I um, had worked for about 10 years, a really stark recognition um, was available to me. We have in the land grant system a kind of classic paradigm of how it's supposed to work. It didn't start this way, I'll, I'll remind you. That is, we in the university, we're pretty smart, we have PhDs, we think of things, and then we tell all of you guys. <laughs> and we have this unidimensional pipeline. We drop pearls out there. With any luck, you pick them up. Well, it's very clear that, as a matter of fact, we were invented in dialogue, and these dialogues are critically important across every scale and every kind of conversation. In fact, this pipeline paradigm had become profoundly insufficient by about 10 years ago, not the least of which was a crisis in the commons, public germplasm, public genetic diversity, public support of genetic diversity is a huge issue for all of us that depend on landscapes and depend on plants. Sharply reduced support of public sector people like me, people who are explicitly committed to the public good and who think carefully about what that means now and in the future. And then finally, a highly consolidated, a dramatically consolidated industry that means, in fact, 
a lot more R&D dollars are spent, but they're not spent the same way. They're spent really focused on a few highly lucrative seed markets. As a public sector plant breeder, I'm not a seed company. I need a seed company as a partner. I end up with a little brown bag of 100 seeds. And so in 2001, we began an approach that has become quite dominant, and I think you're going to get to hear a lot more about it from Michael. We began an experiment called the Public Seed Initiative. Um, it was a radical partnership, governments, nonprofit organizations that were able, in fact, to substitute for some of the eroded public sector capacity at the university. Seed companies, not just the seed companies I knew, but I went and found some more seed companies. Turned out there were seed companies within an hour of my university I had never heard of that sold vegetable seeds, and worse, they had never heard of me. Um, <laughs> and we realized in those dialogues that we had a critical gap in that seed system. And that was we didn't have growers who grew commercial quality seed of smaller scale varieties. I didn't even know that gap existed. And I certainly didn't know how to fill it until we began those conversations. And so long story short, actually it's part of a large grant given to me in genomics. Okay, that's molecular biology. Don't ever be afraid of molecular biology. Um, we began a large outreach program that was, was a serious experiment in a fundamentally different way of working, and that was a highly networked model that delivered adapted varieties, locally adapted varieties in community, where farmers who were interested were empowered to increase seed, select seed, or share seed they had selected themselves with others. And actually, this sounds strange, but one of the most important pieces, one of the most important innovations in this project was paperwork. Because a farmer said, well, I've got this cool thing, and I can't really take care of it, but I'm not giving it to anybody else because it might be valuable. Well, it turns out there's paperwork to deal with that. And in fact, we mobilized a lot of genetic diversity through this network. We empowered small seed companies to get access. We helped them figure out how to do tidy con little contracts with their seed growers that were painless. We had a mobile seed processing unit, and I believe we still do. And so this actually turned out to help us focus on what we called underserved markets. And there are a lot of them connected to seeds in this country and all around the world. One um, interesting application of this project was in organic agriculture. We had no organic ground to do experiments on at that time at Cornell University. And so guess what? We had to do what we always have done and partner with farmers. And so we were very pleased to have the, one of the first products of that published last year called Piecework Pepper after the farm on which it was selected. And, um, and the set of authors in a scientific scholarly publication were all of us, farmers and all, who bred this pepper. We used some molecular tools which sped up our breeding. And so one thing I want to tell you about seeds is we can be really nimble. We can move characteristics around really quickly in many cases but we have to figure out what we're aiming at. So back to West Africa, I was told to aim at that blasted out field. Through a series of partnerships that are now really accessible, we were able to access genetic diversity. It happened to be held by a private seed company that had worked on, it, on the trait that turned out to be critical for 20 years. The criterion for engagement in this project was that company had to be willing to consider providing seed to that market. Not necessarily directly, could be through, through other kinds of partnerships. Long story short, within just a year or two, we had fields like the one in the lower left-hand corner. And we had tomatoes. This is a photograph one of my graduate students sent back from Bamako, Mali in 2007. We had tomatoes. This is the canning factory in Bamako, Mali in 2007. We had more tomatoes. We had a lot of tomatoes, but we didn't have the power to run this canning plant. And so those tomatoes, they sat there and they rotted. And as a matter of fact, the European Union, while we've been doing this project, we checked this all out. We knew they had a canning plant. The European Union had shifted its import policy and these tomatoes wouldn't have gone anywhere anyway. And so those tomatoes in that donkey cart, you know where they're heading? See that canal in the upper left-hand corner of the picture? into the canal. And at that point, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore as a plant breeder. Yield, 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 we got it. But the vulnerable people 
I happened to be in Mali about three weeks ago. The, the, word, on, the word my colleague shared with me is 80% of the children in, in Mali suffer from anemia. I am not doing this anymore. I'm going to work in food systems, and I'm going to think about livelihoods, and I'm going to think about the environment in which my crops are produced. And so, the obvious, unbalanced abundance does not necessarily lead to improved livelihoods, and I would argue it is as important in the developed world to keep our eye on livelihoods. That's where the new agrarians are going to come from, as it is in the developing world, and in this country it is as important to keep our eye on nutritional security as it is in Bamako, Mali. So, it's not that productivity isn't important, of course it is, but it's more complicated than that. Gains in agricultural productivity do not necessarily guarantee the outcomes in human dimensions we care about. Gains, genetic gains in yield potential, whether it's by yield protection, such as disease resistance or raising the yield ceiling, do not necessarily result in actual yield gains on the ground, although they did in our case. Um, Food sufficiency on the planet, condition we enjoy now, of course it does not necessarily guarantee global food security or local food security. This was a big one, this is pretty obvious, but it's important for my community. I tend to, you know, we tend to think, oh, if you just give us money in the research community, everything will be great. Well, actually, agricultural interventions only work when there's a crop. So if there's no rain, there's no crop. Drought tolerance doesn't really help you, does it? And Actually, we just proved something economists already knew, which is they really work better when there's a market for that product. I don't mean just crops, any agricultural commodities. And so finally, a message that is not new for this community, regenerative and restorative practices must be the direct focus of the kind of innovation that occurs in the public sector and on every one of the landscapes you all connect to. Um, and in fact, that recognition of the way systems work and a willingness to explore test and responsibly co collect our assessment of our actions is a community held responsibility of the utmost importance. So back to seeds. I told you a story about vegetables. I'm going to just show you a quick um, snapshot from the cereal world. We have another alarming trend. Actually, in fact, globally, yields of our staple cereals are in many important parts of the world starting to show a plateau. And this is before the droughts we've suffered in this country in the last couple of years. This is a slide from Ken Kassman at the University of Nebraska. On the left-hand side, um, you see a panel showing rice in several important rice-growing parts of the world. Central panel is wheat. Right panel is maize. These are yield plateau. They're occurring for various reasons, not the least of which is exhaustion of soil, climate, and other limitations, and they are of grave concern with respect to overall supply. I spend a lot of time working with the agricultural communities in my state as an ag dean, that was my job. This is a retrospective view. This is not a debate about what's going to happen. This is what has already happened to the temperatures on our climate. On the right hand side is the year 2000, on the left hand side is the year 1000. We are already at least 50 years into significantly warmer temperatures. And any projection going forward is this is just the beginning of a new world. In Wisconsin, this is what has already happened. The bright red parts on our state are where the growing season has shifted already by 30 days. We are already managing agricultural systems in the middle of, of major change. And this is warming temperatures. I can tell you in Wisconsin, about half of the extreme rainfall events and the most extreme events we've ever recorded in Wisconsin have come in about the last 10 to 15 years since we've been keeping records in 1871. We are facing some significant new challenges. And as a plant breeder, I can tell you target environments matter and targets matter. Very quickly, I'm not going to take you through this as a complex slide, but it, why I'm telling you this is um, I've been asked to talk about food security looking forward at that interface between agriculture and food system. On the left, we have a series of projections as to what's going to happen to per capita global food production under optimistic scenarios for the future on the left and pessimistic scenarios for the future on the right, both very reasonable just a little, just tending in, in each direction. The green line across the center is what human beings need to survive. 
The top cluster of lines in each of those has to do with which particular little, um, cli which particular climate model you use. You see, um, on the, in the optimistic scenario, even the low-income developing countries in the lower, in that lower cluster of lines, they're heading up in the right direction. Climate change will have many diverse consequences, not all negative, although it is clear that the world's vulnerable, par the parts of the world that are already suffering from food insecurity are projected to have the most negative consequences of climate change. On the right-hand side, you see even those of us in the world's most developed countries are projected to drop awfully near that green dotted line. This is, by the way, a slide provided to me by the economist who is leading the UN process. This is, this is a very mainstream depiction. The other thing I want you to know about this slide is there's a lot of uncertainty, isn't there? A lot of uncertainty. This makes our work ground up really important because global views given from the, the best kinds of experts don't give us a lot of um, confidence that we've got a plan in, in hand that's going to really work that well. So really, here's the question. How can we move our agricultural practices? And I have now begun to think about provisioning activities. It isn't just agriculture, because we're always working at that land, water, energy, some will say climate, nexus. How can we move our provisioning activities towards better long-term balances? Now, I can tell you that is not a focus. That has not been a focus of the scientific community. We've been divided up in a lot of communities called things like entomology and agronomy and livestock. That's a different way of thinking about this challenge. It does start with seeds, lots of different kinds of seeds, crop seeds, lots of other kinds of seeds, but contexts and systems are really going to be key. And the fundamental question is how can we move our provisioning activities from fundamentally extractive modes to modes that could qualify for the use of words like restorative or regenerative. So really these challenges in some sense define fundamentally new targets for innovation. Growing global population in a closed system. That is not a reality we've contended with in my community very effectively. Diversity is going to be key. Intensifying productivity is going to be key, but in ways that respect ecosystem limits. And every time you scale, you get a different view. Recognition of links and interactions, tipping points, thresholds. Again, these are not words the 20th century research establishment was aimed at, but they're going to be the critical words of this century. And finally, it's really important to realize it isn't just the number of us, it's what happens when we get more affluent. And of course, in some sense, that's what we really want for our kind, is to, is to um, be relieved from the condition of poverty, which tracks almost every bad thing you can think of. Yet as that condition is relieved in the food systems we have today, demand intensifies, pressure on agriculture, provisioning pressure intensifies. And so one other important thing I want to tell you is our ability to even account for our, our activities on the planet, as you saw, could use some big improvements. Some of these changes may not be so disruptive and are already happening. I gave a, um, a keynote to the Mexican Plant Improvement Project. There were a lot of sorghum people in the audience, and they sent me this picture from Nebraska. That's what our cornfields looked like this last summer in Wisconsin. Blasted out, really challenged yields. Sorghum looked great. And sorghum is a crop of, of well-known in the heartland um, with lots of, of purposes that are well understood, including feed. Um, so next year, the question for these guys is, would you grow the blasted out thing in the back or would you grow the thing in the front? However, we know that it isn't just about picking a crop or a staple crop. It's going to be now about a whole host of interactions. And this is a slide that one of my associates, a former graduate student at Cornell, who's now with me as a postdoctoral associate at Madison, did for me and for you, showing that in fact, as we think about even something as simple as a seed, we're looking at a whole host of interactions, many of which we understand very, very little about, and many of which we have not fully leveraged in our agricultural system. So the crop plant is in the center, but in fact, we know that crop plant has many different interfaces, even with its, the smallest scale environment, and in fact, a host of interactions, and I'll highlight in particular the soil as the frontier for the 21st century. Um, but there are many, many other ways in which um, these interactions either 
constrain our, our productivity or potentially could boost it. So we have lots and lots of interactions that are very local, that are really important, and that we have historically not zeroed in on. Those of you managing pastures as systems, in, se in some sense, are doing exactly what I'm talking about already. You know you, you, you do experiments, you watch differences in outcomes, you're managing communities even if you're not thinking about it that way. And I know many of you in this room absolutely are thinking about it that way. This slide shows in some sense with the blue spiral down the bottom, the mode we're generally in globally, a cycle of degradation, bringing many thousands of hectares of land out of agriculture on a global basis every year. Um, so we have, and, and I've shown you the yield plateau. We're in a fundamentally extractive mode we're, we're, um, we're eroding the very basis we need looking forward. The goal now, as far as, as many of us I know in the room are concerned, is to flip us up into these so-called virtuous cycles, cycles that in, from local to global, renew, restore, maintain, improve, in cycles that boost productivity, and it's not just productivity of one commodity, the focus on multiple benefits per area. So it's not even just efficiency anymore, although efficiency is really important. It's on multiple benefits per area is really critical. I want to just highlight, since I've been asked to talk about seeds, some of the ways this, these insights are starting to show up very actively. Cover crops, long known to many communities, are now coming front and center even for mainstream agriculture. And so we have oddly tended to just, we breed our crops and we find our cover crops. Well, I can tell you there's tremendous opportunity for innovation in these species, but many of them are species that people don't even know. We don't have germplasm collections. We don't have breeders. Um, so cover crops, and I've listed the benefits of cover crops all down the, uh, the side. Again, a really important part of agricultural systems here and in the developed world. Another strategy that involves seeds and is used broadly, it's familiar, really focuses on risk mitigation. I work with big agriculture, I work with small agriculture, I work with agriculture in the developed world, I work with agriculture in the developing world. Risk mitigation is now getting to be front and center in the way we manage our agricultural systems. And so this is, a, this is water spinach, it's a plant that nobody paid too much attention to, but you can have a nutritious crop in less than 30 days and it grows shortly after typhoons. Well, we seem to be having more of those. And, um, and they're occurring in places like Bangladesh, extremely populated countries, extremely vulnerable to rising sea levels and typhoons. So we're, we're looking at species like this with new eyes or nutritionally dense, very short season. And, um, and so we're breeding current crops for early maturity, faster in, faster out. That's a risk mitigation strategy. New species that are rapid cycling like this and new environments, including peri-urban environments and urban environments. And the urban agriculture movement is initially was not viewed seriously. I can tell you now it's getting some very, very exciting and interesting places. And speaking of renewal and regeneration, some of the work I've gotten to see right close to home in Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit is incredibly inspiring. So I'm going to pop this view up to show you how we're thinking about food security now. It's not just about driving yield of a staple commodity. It's really about ensuring that, our, that the population in question, particularly recognizing maternal health and childhood as vulnerable times where even a short gap in nutritional security can have lifelong effects. We're thinking now about the word in the middle, which you're thinking about too, agroecological intensification. Again, this is a word that means we are using our provisioning, the, the resources from which we provision ourselves with as much breadth and creativity as possible, recognizing we, we would like to continue doing that. We need to continue those activities into the future. So it isn't just about productivity and sustainable, sustainable agriculture. It's about thinking really carefully and holding ourselves accountable for outcomes and human dimensions, nutrition and health in particular. It's about livelihoods everywhere. And markets, value chains, livelihoods, Gus Beth talked a lot about this last night, are going to be really important. And innovations in those systems, which I expect many of you are, in fact, leading, 
are going to be really exciting mechanisms towards that future that we hope to see. Now, I'm going to finish up by reporting in from the global front lines. Um, in response to both the global threats I've described and some of the potential opportunities, um, an international system focused on agricultural research and food security came together to respond to converging threats, population growth, climate change, degradation of core resources, um, where the science community had best managed to really kind of describe ourselves, describe what we're doing as we drive off the cliff. Um, and also to manage these emerging challenges, food insecurity, nutritional insecurity, poor public health, resource competition, land degradation, and, and mitigation of greenhouse gases. A commission was convened, a global commission, 13 commissioners from around the world, um, called together to focus on sustainable agriculture in the face of climate change. And speaking of partnerships, the logos along the bottom of this slide are an unusual team of players because for the first time at a global level, the agricultural research community came together with a large global network of organizations fo focused on earth system science. And in fact, the global donors who worry about development agriculture were at the table as well. So, 13 of us were identified from around the world, each of us bringing a different kind of scientific expertise. Um, this was um, a remarkable group to be a part of. I was um, honored to represent the United States. Sir John Beddington, who is the UK chief scientist, was the chair of the commission. And um, many of these are extremely influential leaders. And I can tell you one of the most important benefits of this commission is we are continuing to work together with all the influence each one of us has and with, with the, the technical and other resources we bring. I want to particularly point out the woman from um, third in from the, um, on the bottom line, Rita Sharma. Rita sits on the National Advisory Council chaired by Sonia Gandhi in India. Rita is the author of Right to Food legislation going through the Indian Parliament right now. It is the first time on this planet we are working to legislate food security as a human right. We hope that legislation will pass early next year. And, and we understand that that kind of commitment is going to set into place a whole host of dynamics none of us understand well enough. And so we're hoping that with these innovations, this is a big deal. With these innovations, as much as there is much to admire in that commitment, we understand with agricultural and food systems that may not be prepared for that, we're going to have a lot of dynamics going into play. Watching those is going to be really important and really key, and the rest of us intend to help her. We were not to do new things, although we did do some new things, but there are a number of fantastic studies. Any of you who are interested, I commend any of these, and, and there's a website connected to the commission that has many of these links on it. We were tasked to do something really important, which was to synthesize from all of this information, much of which was descriptive as opposed to action-oriented, concrete steps that governments and the rest of us could take um, towards a different, a world with better outcomes. And so I'm going to review with you very quickly the seven recommendations that this commission put forward. These were released at a major um, plant meeting called Planet Under Pressure in London of the, uh, earlier this year. These recommendations do a number of really important things that haven't been done before. They are a package of recommendations. It's not just about boosting crop yields and forgetting about everything else. These are recommendations anchored in global and local food system. So another thing these recommendations do is they consider us as a global family. So these, initially the concept was we would focus in the developing world, but these dynamics affect every single one of us and actions every one of us can take have global consequences. So the first couple are sort of mandatory for a commission like this. But they're very important because they're why I'm here with you and they're why I go a lot of other places on Earth. It is to recognize that in any activity that relates to natural resource use, and if you're interested this, you don't have to take notes, this presentation is available and um, there is a website with both a summary for policymakers and a much more detailed report with examples of each one of these recommendations implemented somewhere on Earth. 
The idea is that actually almost everything we do needs to be connected to food security and nutritional health and that sustainable provisioning strategies are a core part of any kind of future we want for this country. It isn't just about social justice, although of course it's about that. It's about national security. It's about peace and prosperity. We know that we are profoundly underinvested globally and here in this country with respect to innovation in this space. And I've just told you, in fact, we got a lot of room to improve the targets we aim at, never mind the resources we have to aim at them. And the innovation, of course, doesn't just occur in any one sector. Every one of you managing landscapes is an innovator. Third recommendation is important, and I'm going to highlight four of the, three of these recommendations, or four, as especially germane for the conversation for you over the next two days. Sustainable intensification is a really important term in the global community. Climate smart agriculture is another term that's getting used a lot. I'll tell you, we don't know exactly what that means. <laughs> we actually really don't know what that means yet. We know it's probably not where we are now. Um, recommendation number four, I'm just going to highlight here and then flip to some slides in more detail. One really important thing to realize in this country and everywhere else is just because we innovate in agriculture and improve our food systems, the most vulnerable people suffering now are not necessarily affected positively and potentially even could be affected negatively. So it's critically important always to take a view, an accurate holistic view of the condition of the human beings in the zone of conversation at any time. Let me just pick up a couple of these recommendations, notably sustainable intensification. I want to just make sure this audience understands what this word means. It does not necessarily mean in the 20th century mode industrialization. It means focusing on multiple benefits through time and across space. You can think of it as intensifying the range of niches through time and space we occupy on our landscapes. Um, that means more diversity on the landscape. It means we're thinking through time as I showed you in that um, slide. So it's not just food security when the crop hits or um, at Thanksgiving. It's food security all the time connected to health. We have many policy actions that can be taken, and in this country, you've watched in this Farm Bill discussions moving from direct subsidies to insurance. But I'm going to tell you, if you're interested in this debate, go look at the details, please, and pay attention. Because the way those insurance policies are being um, implemented are extremely significant, and I think you might have a lot of interesting things to learn if you look at the details, which are, by the way, really challenging to look at, unless you're an expert. Um, <laughs> that's, that's part of why it's so important for you to look at the details. <laughs> um, and connecting improvements in agriculture to improvements in human outcomes. Yield gaps are a really important part of this, but watch the consumption of these types of diagrams. Because yield gaps necessarily focus on a dominant crop. And I've just told you it's actually productivity of the whole system. This shows you that anywhere there's light color on that, gra get that map, we're falling well short, sometimes way short, of yield potentials. We think by managing systems in, in more knowledge-intensive ways, not necessarily more input-intensive ways, that may be the most exciting way to look at these yield gaps. Recommendation number five I want to highlight is a really important part of the way this, this, these recommendations go together. Again, it's not just agriculture's job to fill an unlimited demand. The demand has a critically important role to play on the pressure agriculture puts on our resources. And so this recommendation highlights um, the following observation. This is the structure of the world diet between 2005 and 2007, as best as, some, as major experts can tell. From left to right, you see diets playing out from the poorest to the richest parts of the world in general you can see a tremendous difference on Earth now with respect to how human beings provision themselves with respect to dietary demand. On the left, you see high-carbohydrate diet, low-fat diet. On the right, you see how in energy intensive or how um, intensive that shift to a higher-fat diet is. At the same time, there is, of course, abundant evidence that the diets on the right are not only more, more expensive energetically in terms of resources, they're worse for our public health in average. 
Sixth recommendation, really, really an important recommendation when you're thinking about food systems, waste. Waste is important in the developed world. Waste is important in, in the developing world. Waste occurs for different reasons. But the following slide shows you how significant it is. And estimates are between 30 and 60 percent of what we produce in agriculture is wasted, both from the point of view of inadequate infrastructure and also things like food safety. And we, it's, not, it's not a difficult observation in our industrialized food systems to note that actually it's not an accident this happens because profit goes with volume moved through the food system. So we've got incentives that push food out and down your drain if it's sour milk. Um, and so really thinking critically and systematically about this is going to be really important. And I can tell you we're starting to hire people called waste engineers. Um, I was just at Texas A&M University the last couple days, and it's the chemical engineers thinking about waste that are bringing some incredibly exciting ideas about what to do about this. I'm going to wrap up with a recommendation that probably seems really boring. But actually, some of us thought it should be the only recommendation, or at least we argued that it could be the only recommendation in the entire portfolio. We need to understand in a holistic frame what we're doing and how we're doing it and what the consequences of these choices are looking forward. That both warns us about dangers, but it also brings into, t into clear view what our targets for innovation are. And so this recommendation fo focuses on creating improved, comprehensive, shared, this is where radical partnership gets really interesting, integrated information systems that cover human and environmental dimensions and track interaction slow and fast variables, which move asynchronously um, in agricultural systems. I'm going to just conclude with a few slides that show some partnerships that are coming together around this recommendation. These are two of my PhD students that just finished in the last couple of years. They arrived, one from Harvard, one from Yale, wanting to save the world through plant breeding and molecular biology. They left entrepreneurs. And they have a company I will commend to your attention. I'm not sure they're ready for range yet, but they're looking at cropland. The company's called Ag Squared. They actually got this idea while they were traveling in Bamako. The one on the left is the one that sent those pictures back. Ag Squared is a software company meant to help those managing small operations sustainably or organically keep track of what they're doing. It's field rotations, it's business records, it's organic certification. That's not what they thought they were going to do, and I'm very excited to see what happens with the experiment they're doing with themselves. I get to be part of a partnership post-deanship that is taking a remarkable shape and bringing together a stunning array of partners around the world. Each of those layers is what we call a data layer. It's a synthesis of an enormous array of information assets, now disparate, typically held by different people, not interoperable. We can't use them for many times. The, the, what we know, we can't really use. So a remarkable, radical partnership of players is coming together around the world to stitch together information assets using new approaches, not giant data warehouses. This is not about giant, big, bulky things. This is about really nimble connection of knowledge and information. We're getting some help from some strange places. If you ask our military what one of the gravest threats to our future is, it's water security. It's food, nutrition, and soil security, and energy, energy security, probably in that order. And so this is one of the capabilities we're using to stitch together those information assets. These guys, multi-agency collaboration environment, came together after 9-11. Because if we had known, if we knew we knew what we knew, we wouldn't have had 9-11. <laughs> I think we know what we know about agriculture and food systems. And um, these guys understand the threat and the opportunity. So at least in wa while I was in Washington, I can tell you our military recognizes, our military defense and intelligence establishments understand that full bellies are part of what a peaceful future are going to look like. So I'm going to end with a quote that I think is really important. Um, the point is a balance, not unbalanced extractive productivity. And that is the basic goal. This quote comes from a really eminent ecologist. And I hate to tell you the year I had to sanitize it for 
for sexist language, <laughs> 1969. It has been obvious for a long time that profound shifts are necessary to bring our systems in balance for our kind and for our planet. You're doing that. Probably many of you in this room are doing it every day and have been for a long time because you understood something that many of the rest of us are starting to understand, which is the choices we make in agriculture ground up are going to be a critical, important part of setting a plan of being part of a future that's food secure, peaceful, and prosperous. I'm really honored to be with you as you consider that challenge ground up and delighted to be the warm-up act for your next speaker. Thank you. <laughs>